The worlds were prepared by the word of God. So the material universe does not start with the material. There's a spiritual power that began it. God's word is the creative material, you could say. His word is the creative power, and he spoke it. You know, there's all these belief systems, you know, where'd the world come from? Where'd the universe come from? The Christian has the most cogent, sharp, blessed answer to the question of why are we here? Who put us here? How do we get created? So it says there that in the beginning, verse one, God created the heavens and the earth. That is, it wasn't a self creation, it wasn't material like a big bang, somehow and there's an explosion, like uh, purposeless, you know, without purpose, random stuff. This was, this was intended. God is the creator. He is the one who begins it. Sometimes people think that science and scripture are opposed. They are not opposed. Certain interpretations of science may be, but science as what it is. That is, to be a clear-thinking Christian is not to be unscientific. That is, people, people sometimes make a conflict between science and scripture in order to either discredit the truth of God's word or to ignore the glory of God in the physical and material world. The focus of the book of Genesis 1 through 11 is history. That is, God himself gives us an eyewitness account of something we never could have understood because none of us were there to see it. There's a man named Francis Schaeffer who says this about creation in his book, Genesis and Time. He says, the Bible is not a scientific textbook if by that one means that its purpose is to give us exhaustive truth or that scientific fact is its central theme and purpose. That is, the Bible's giving us an historical statement of truth. It's true. It's not untrue. But it has a purpose to it. It's not meant to be an exhaustive manual where you look things up and you have a table of, okay, where's the atom and where's this? But that's not what it's doing. It's, it's giving us a, a history to show us our meaning and our purpose and our value. But when it does touch on science, it's not unscientific. The problem is that we just have to understand what it's saying and some things we won't know until the second coming. And I would say it's not a metaphor. It's, it's talking about in terms that we could understand. You know, so on day um, three, you have unconscious life. Vegetation and trees is unconscious life. Day five, you have conscious life. Day four, you have the sun and the moon and the seasons being regulated by the heavenly bodies so that the life that is on the earth can be regulated. The life can, can go in cycles, that God puts the lights and the, light, the night and the day to give order to what he's creating. And then day six are the, are the animals of, of the field. And so what distinguishes men and women from, you could say, the animals and the lizards and the birds is that we're made in the image of likes of God, but, but even deeper, we think, we reflect, we have a personality, we can reason, we can understand. Men and women are at the crown of creation. We're, we're the apex of it. But I don't want us to miss the significance of the sixth day. Adam and Eve are created to rule over God's works. They're created for nobility. They're created for royalty. They're created to care for and manage everything God makes. What a privilege. That is different from anyone else. That's not the angels. It doesn't say the angels are done for that. We're created for that. And we have to know why were we created? Why do we exist? So in looking at this, it says that we're made in the image of God. God's image is mainly what's inside of us. There's the outside, right? Like what we're seeing here. That is a part of God's image. But his image is more so, it's a spiritual and a moral image. And it's seen in our free will. It's seen in our ability to choose. It, it's seen in that God didn't make a bunch of monkeys and robots and machines. He made people to rule because he wants us to choose to love him and serve him. That's where your dignity comes from. When by your free will, you choose to love Jesus Christ. So I'm speaking to you all as Christians here for a minute. When every day you say, Lord, I am going to love you. I'm going to serve you. That's dignity. That's free will. 
It doesn't matter how you feel when you make that choice. The point is that you make the choice. Every day, you want God's image and likeness to be seen in you. So in one sense, God's image and likeness still does exist, even in fallen men and women, because we have speech. That's an expression of God's image in us because God spoke. But there's something else. There is the image of Jesus Christ being formed in us. Adam and Eve weren't made perfect, but they were made innocent, and they were meant to develop into something. All this creation was meant to grow. It wasn't meant to stay like this. It's the beginning, right? It was meant to become something more than, than what it is. We're made to become something more than what we are right now. The New Testament says we're growing in a certain direction. But here's, here's what I also want to say about the beginning of this book. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So I wanted to end like this. What was before the beginning? Like, what was before the beginning? Like you say, well, there's a beginning, but wait. But before the beginning, there was something else. And the scripture tells us that there were two things. I'm not saying there aren't other things, but what we're told. In John 17, verse 24, the Lord Jesus said, you loved me. He's praying to the heavenly father. You loved me before the creation of the world. What existed before Genesis 1-1 is love. Love was there. What else was there? There was communication because it says God spoke. So there is communication between God. There is love. There is communication. And in that, you have relationship because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are relating to each other. This is before we show up. So what's been stamped on all of us, what's been stamped on us is something eternal because love and relationship and communication, it predates these six days. It comes before that. And that's been put on you. It's been put in us. So men and women are not made for the earth. We're made for heaven. You might say we're in two worlds, but we're made for heaven. Heaven is our home. That's our true home is heaven. The earth is not your hope. So yeah, there could be a big earthquake like in San Francisco, 1906, much city burned up. Chicago fire, 1880, that all burned up. Riots today, things come and go. But our home is in heaven. And that's what we can get from Genesis 1 is really we're coming home. Our Christian life, we're moving towards home. Even now we have a, a heavenly entrance, the book of Hebrews tells us. Even now we can be in that heavenly tent. But all this stuff in Genesis 1, it was ultimately, it was meant so that we could have relationship and fellowship with God himself. It wasn't created so that we would love the creation more than the creator. It's a backdrop so that the Father and Adam and Eve and the Father, Son, Holy Spirit and Adam and Eve and the kids could all be together and love and care and concern and things would grow around them. That's ultimately like the setup here. Why is it there? It has to do with us. It's very much about us, it's very much about the church, very much about God's coming kingdom. What an incredible privilege we have. I would say that there is something to keep in mind about this. Genesis 1 is so much like John chapter 1, because it says there in verse 3, let there be light, and there was light. And that phrase, let there be light, is talked about in John 1. God is bringing forth light. And in 2 Corinthians 3, we're told that just as God spoke light when there was darkness, so God brings the light of the gospel of the glory of God into a dark heart. That is, when a heart is dark, when, when a heart is in rebellion, that light can be created in that heart through the gospel, just like in Genesis 1, it's spoken here. So these things in Genesis 1 are like beginning something that continues through the scriptures, themes, ideas, patterns. And in John 1, we're told that the Lord Jesus is the light of the world. And in him bringing light, he is the light of men. Somehow, everybody, everybody is given an understanding of God's purpose somehow through the Savior, because he is the light of men. The key is, will you accept the light or reject it? But the light is there 